Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you here today. My name is Rob Kaczynski, pastor of Trinity United Methodist Church. I'd like to welcome you all into our worship service this morning. And if you are joining us online, we welcome you into our sanctuary as we come and we gather, we break bread together, we share the message with one another, and we live out God's love together. And if you are joining us over the radio, we welcome you as well into our sanctuary this morning as we glorify God as a expanded community of faith reaching all throughout our community into our world. It's just great having you here today. Uh, we're we're going to be we're in our penultimate series of uh, of redeeming laughter, and so Melissa Madera, Reverend Melissa Madera, will be preaching for us today, talking about rebellious laughter. So I uh, can't wait to hear that, and uh, we'll be breaking bread a little bit later on in communion. So I'm glad you're here. Some really quick uh, announcements. Ash Wednesday is on February 14th this, this year, which is Valentine's Day. Uh, but we welcome you to come a little bit earlier for, for Ash Wednesday's service because we have some experiences for you to go through before you enter into worship. We're also asking that you bring a 12 or 16 ounce clear jar uh, to, to bring with you on that day. It's, it's so you could go through some of these experiences and it'll, it'll help you. So we would love to see you there. It's our beginning of Lent as we enter into the wilderness during Lent, um, beginning on February 14th. Throughout Lent, we have a couple of different uh, classes that you could try or, or different ways to go through Lent. We have something called the Lent Experience, which is a, a journaling activity uh, that you follow along online. Uh, if you're interested in that, you could Q, uh, scan the QR code or write in your connection card if you are, would prefer to do it that way and I'll have Sarah or Dilly uh, get a hold of you and tell you how you can go through this together. Um, you could also sign up for my own study called uh, Witness, uh, Witness to the Cross. Uh, this may be the last Sunday to sign up for that if you're interested in, in that. Um, that will be on a night of the week. I forget which one, which one I said. I think it's Wednesdays. Uh, Wednesdays. Uh, and it'll be online and in person if you're interested in signing up for that. Parents. If you are looking for a great way to spend post-Valentine's Day on the 15th of, of February from 6 to 8, the youth group would love to take your children. <laughs> Perfect. That was not a setup at all. Look at that. He's even raising his hand like, I'm in, right? Willie is in for that. So, uh, if you have a child that is very eager to hang out with a youth group, or if you're a parent that is ready to hand your kid over for a couple hours to the youth group, so you could celebrate either by yourself or with your spouse, from 6 to 8, love to have just to watch your kiddos while you uh, uh, rekindle your love life or even just take a time to relax. Um, so, love to see them there Thursday the 15th. Our mission focus of the month is the, what is it again? Yeah, Fruit Belt Farm Workers. See these glasses, I need updated. Um, Fruit Belt Farm Workers Ministry, we'll hear a lot more about them next week. Just love to uh, remember to support them in all we do. It is so good to have you here this morning. Let us all stand for our opening course.
Good morning. I'm Brian Miller, and I'm happy to be your liturgist today. Would you join me in the responsive opening? Jesus calls us to be the light of the world, to loose the bonds of injustice, open the eyes that are blind, and deliver from prison those who sit in darkness. God invites us to be a light to the nations, to carry God's salvation to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit dwells in us, giving us strength to do God's work, living God's foolish hope for us and for the world. And now please join in the singing of the opening hymn, The God of Abraham Praise, number 116. Now, please join me in the congregational prayer, and then there will be a moment of silence concluding with the Lord's Prayer. God of light, we confess that we have gone astray and have left your light. We follow the dim lights of the world of success and fortune. We follow the dim lights that call us to be more religious by following rules. We follow the fading light of personal salvation. Forgive us for not seeking the true light of your love for all the world. Forgive us for not following the ways of Jesus, who commanded us to love one another. Call us to be light bearers of love, compassion, and justice, in which the mystery of your love is revealed. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Please join with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now take a moment to greet your neighbors in Christian love.
Today's scripture lesson is taken from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 20. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Hua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dwelt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now, please join in him. Give to the winds thy fears. Hymn number 129. <laughs> Good morning, my friends. Let us pray. O oh God, speak through me, if necessary, in spite of me and always beyond me, that your words may be heard and lived by your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to begin by inviting you to close your eyes for a brief moment. And picture, just for a moment, the funniest person you know. Maybe this person is a comedian. Maybe it's somebody who you don't actually know, but you feel like you know them because their comedy routines are just that good. They draw you in. Or maybe it's a friend or a loved one who just consistently makes you laugh. Bring their face to your mind for a moment. And once you have that person in mind, think about this. 
what is it about this person that is so funny? What is it about their jokes or their way of being in the world that makes you laugh? Now open your eyes. That was not an invitation to take a nap. Seriously, open your eyes. <laughs> when I think about the funniest people in my life, I think of three people. First, my dad. He is a master of using humor to break tension and helping people to feel peaceful and at ease. And he does this with really, really, really bad puns. Sometimes puns heaped on top of puns heaped on top of more puns. It is awful. I spend all of my time around my dad groaning and rolling my eyes, and it is hilarious. For my dad, finding ways to laugh, even in the midst of life's painful moments, and my dad has had a lot of very painful moments, helps us to weather the worst that life throws our way. It's a way to help us hold on to joy, to life, to vitality, even when the worst life circumstances steal that joy away from us, or at least threaten to. Second, I think of one of my college English professors who had a very sharp and very dry wit about her. But you had to be paying close attention to catch it. She would deliver the most surprising one-liners at the most unexpected times. And if you were daydreaming through class, you would entirely miss it, and generally you would be the butt of the joke. But for those who were paying close attention, she was absolutely hilarious. For her, humor was a teaching tool. She knew that if she could get us to laugh about a subject, we would be more likely to want to engage with that subject and we would be more likely to remember it. I also think about my favorite comedian. What makes this particular person so funny is that they basically use their own life as a really big joke book. They're able to laugh at themselves, and in so doing, they normalize not being perfect all the time. It's okay to be a little bit broken and messy, to struggle to make sense of life, because we're all in this struggle together, and we know that because we can laugh with one another about it. And then this comedian also uses humor to speak deep truths about the nature of life and people and systems and power in a way that is profoundly empowering to those who have been pushed down by these very people and systems. So for this particular comedian, humor is a unifier, a recognition that we are all in this life together, and it is also an act of resistance and rebellion. For the last several weeks, we've been exploring laughter and humor in scripture, and surprisingly enough, it has not been at all hard to find instances where God or and or God's people are finding reasons to laugh. Importantly, though, it seems throughout Scripture, and especially throughout the Old Testament where most of the really good jokes in the Bible are found, humor is almost always presented with a specific purpose in mind. The best humor in Scripture almost always comes right alongside a major point or a core revelation about who God is. When Elijah is laughing that the Canaanite god Baal must be going to the bathroom. He is echoing the first commandment and the greatest of them all. Worship the Lord your God and serve God alone. It doesn't get much more foundational than this. Jonah uses a comedy of errors to get to the question, is there anybody who was beyond the grip of God's grace? And the answer is an emphatic no. Neither the evil Ninevites nor the wayward prophet can go anywhere where God can't find them, and neither can we. And as we will see today, the words and the actions of the Hebrew midwives announce a profound truth. God doesn't care how powerful or how lowly we think we are. God has come to bring life, especially to those who are overlooked, oppressed, or invisible. So to really understand the deep 
irony and thus the deep humor embedded into today's story, we need to take a step back and explore a little bit of the language, culture, and history that is at the heart of this story. So I'm going to ruin a really good joke by explaining it. The earliest roots of this story don't actually start in the book of Exodus. They go back quite a few generations, back to the earliest fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, most specifically Jacob. Those of you who are around here a fair bit will know by now that Jacob is a little bit like a cat. He seems to creep his way into more than a few sermons that I preach, and maybe one of these days I'll spend some time in deep personal reflection about why I am so captivated by this guy. But for today, the most important part of Jacob's story is the moment in the middle of Jacob's life when he's caught off guard by a stranger in the middle of the night, a stranger who is later revealed to be God, who wrestles with him all night long and finally ends by blessing Jacob and sending him forth with a brand new name, Israel. From that moment forward, Jacob's old life would be behind him, and he and all of his descendants would have a new identity, a new purpose, a new trajectory in life. Literally, Israel means one who struggles with God. And as we see throughout Israelite history, the people live deeply into that name. The Israelite people struggle a lot. They have seasons when they follow God closely, and they have seasons when they forget about the God who calls them. But their one constant, the thing that never, ever, ever changes for the people of Israel is that even when they struggle, even when they stray, even when they wander or fall or forget, God is never far away. And their name reminds them of that fact. Their name is a constant reminder to them of who they are and whose they are. That changes in the first chapter of the book of Exodus, though. In the first few verses, we are reintroduced to the Israelite people. They've been living in Egypt now for many years, so many years that their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, who brought them to Egypt, have long since faded from memory. They are doing well as a people, very well. They've been fruitful, they've multiplied, they've grown strong and willful and independent. And that makes the Egyptian king very nervous. The king doesn't like knowing that there is a group of people who are big enough and strong enough to potentially overpower and overthrow him if they would ever choose to. Not that they would choose to, not that they had ever given the king any reason whatsoever to believe that they were anything other than happy, peaceful people with a deep love for life who were grateful to have a home to live in. Nope, the Israelites were strong and potentially powerful, and therefore they were scary, and they must be subdued. And the first thing he does is to strip them of their name. It's sneaky and it is subtle. In fact, when we read this story, we probably don't even notice it happening. In verse 9, the king remarks that the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. And then the next time that the people are referred to by name, it's in verse 15 when the king of Egypt begins speaking to, quote, the Hebrew midwives. Did you catch that shift? The Israelite people are no longer Israelites. Now they are Hebrews. And that's how they're referred to throughout the rest of the book of Exodus. Today we might not think much of this. Hebrew is, after all, the name of the language that they spoke, the language that the entire Old Testament was written in. We tend to look at Hebrew as being synonymous with Israelite, but the truth is that it's not, not even close. Scholars differ a lot on the meaning of the word, the name Hebrew. Literally, it means on the other side, of the opposition, or different from the others. In other words, not us, or from somewhere else, roughly equivalent to our English term, immigrant. And over time, the, Hebrew, the word Hebrew came to refer not just to someone from somewhere else who may potentially be scary, 
but more specifically to an Israelite of a very low socioeconomic class, someone unrefined, uneducated, unfit for polite society. Our equivalent words might be trailer trash or ghetto. So the Israelite people go from being people who have a name, an identity given to them as a gift from God himself to being seen as nothing more than poor trash, outsiders with no place or no name, no status, no inherent worth. So first, Pharaoh starts by name calling. And here's a quick aside, a bit of wisdom, especially for any young people or not so young people who sometimes fall prey to the tactics of bullies. The moment someone starts to revert to name calling, it's because they know they have essentially lost the fight. And their own only hope of saving face or regaining the upper hand is to try to mock or discredit the person they're fighting against. Name calling is a last resort power move. The Pharaoh knows that he doesn't have the moral upper hand here, and so he does the only thing he knows to do. He labels the Israelites with a pejorative label that he hopes will stick. He uses the power of language to convince his people that the Israelites were dirty and dangerous, not to be trusted or employed in any meaningful way. And then once that works, he uses their less than status to push them into forced labor. There have been a few major powerful people on the world stage who we can probably name who have used these very tactics. But still, even through it all, the Israelite people continue to grow and to prosper. They're strong and they are full of life and full of energy, full of something beyond Pharaoh himself can comprehend. And that, frankly, scares the bejeebies out of him. Pharaoh. He's scared enough of them to begin with, and his last-ditch effort to push the Israelite people down only leads to them getting stronger and more full of life. So Pharaoh, who is now completely unhinged, and he has probably just about lost his mind, decides to go with the nuclear option. He issues an order that all of the newborn baby boys be killed, because they're a threat, right? It seems really stupid, if you ask me. His entire labor force, the people who are literally building his kingdom from the ground up, are made up of strapping young men. By ordering that an entire generation of young boys be cut off, he's basically ensuring that in 15 to 20 years from now, he's going to have nobody to build his empire. But he's not thinking that far ahead. He just thinks Israelites are scary. Israelite men are especially scary. If I can keep the Israelites from making more men, the threat will be gone, and once again, I will be the most powerful man in the world. And because he's more than a little bit intimidated by Israelite men and terrified of their power, he decides to go to the low lowliest, least scary, least powerful people of all to carry out his dirty work for him. The women. As a woman, I love this portion of the story. First off, the writer tells us the names of the midwives, Shifra and Pua. This is super intentional. Women, especially women who have a minor passing role in the story, aren't often named in scripture, but the writer of this story went to great lengths to tell us these women's names, to let us know exactly who they are so that we would know and remember them. In contrast, do you know who's never named? Named? Not even once? The king, Pharaoh. It's actually kind of comical. Even to this day, there is disagreement among scholars as to who this king actually was. He went to such great lengths to build a powerful kingdom and to become one of the most powerful rulers in history, and now we have absolutely no clue who this man actually was. But we know exactly who the women were. Shifra and Pua, these two Hebrew women, poor, low class, not fit for polite society, nobodies, with zero power and zero influence. Their names are the names that, are, that we are still speaking today, thousands of years later, not the kings. 
And then I absolutely love, love, love their sass. They seem to have absolutely no fear. They outright refuse the king's orders, breaking the law and putting themselves at great risk for being put to death themselves for their defiance. And when questioned about it, here is their response. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Let's break this apart a little bit. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. I love the shade that he casts against the Pharaoh's people. And I love how the midwives use Pharaoh's own words here. They don't call the women Israelites. They call them, call themselves, Hebrews. They're basically saying, so this is how you see us? You see us as Hebrews? Outsiders? Lowlifes? Threats to your crown? Okay, let's go with that. We lowlifes aren't anything like you. I love this. Rather than being offended by Pharaoh's name calling, they roll with it. They own it. They poke fun at it. They turn it into an almost self-deprecating kind of humor, showing that they can laugh at themselves. And if they can turn Pharaoh's insults against them into a joke that they can laugh at, then they can't be hurt by whatever Pharaoh might throw in their direction. They just took all of the wind out of Pharaoh's sails. And then they fire right back, playing fast and loose with Pharaoh's deepest fears. Pharaoh is afraid of what he doesn't know, afraid of people he doesn't understand, afraid of anyone and anything different, afraid of the other. The midwives are basically saying, you know what, O king whose name we will forget tomorrow? Your worst fears? Absolutely true. You should be afraid of us because we are different than you. We are scary. You will never understand us. And then they go on. For they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. This word vigorous... Chayot in the Hebrew is an interesting one because it can have a number of different meanings. We usually see it translated here as vigorous or lively or having the vigor of life. But it can also have some not so positive connotations. It can also be translated as brutish, animalistic, unrefined, untethered, or uncontrollable. I love that one. Not all that different from the ways that the Hebrews themselves were known and understood. So basically, yup, we're Hebrews. Hebrew women at that. You can't understand us, so don't even try. We're lively, untethered animals. And you can't control us. And you never will. And Pharaoh thought that he only had to worry about the men. Friends, did I mention that I love this story? (laughs) I love all of the different layers of humor here. I love that it was precisely the people who Pharaoh underestimated the most that got the last laugh. I love the sheer nerve of the women, the way that they stared into the face of power unblinking, and in that, they discovered their power. I love that this wasn't a long, drawn-out comedy routine. It was just one remark, one short little line, like the little zingers that my college professor would throw in to make sure we were still paying attention. And I wonder if Pharaoh even got it, that he even realized that he was the punchline of their joke. I love the irony that in order to bring about a mass genocide, he decided to try to enlist the help of the very people who literally bring life into the world. And then he wondered why in the world that didn't work. I love the humor, but what I love even more is the deeper truth that the humor points to. And there are a lot of deep truths here. The truth that it is those who we underestimate the most that have the most to offer. The truth that life and vitality and joy and vibrancy 
are not dependent upon external circumstances. Even when life throws pain, deep pain, excruciating pain our way, we may not be able to choose happiness, but we can always choose life, and we can choose joy. The truth that real power doesn't come from status or position, and it rarely looks like what we might expect. The truth that no matter the names that people call us or the disparaging remarks that people may make against us, our core identity does not change. We are children of God first and foremost, and nothing and nobody can take that away from us, ever. The truth that biblical women are rock stars. The truth that women are rock stars. Sorry, I just had to throw that one out there. The truth that fear, especially fear of those who are not like us, will rarely serve us well. And acting impulsively on that fear may, in fact, bring about that which we fear the most. The truth that we don't have to be in the spotlight to make an impact. We only have to use what limited gifts that God has given us. And if the gift of sass is all we have in the moment, God will use that too. Thanks be to God. The truth that God cares deeply for those who are hurting, and God is at work making all things new, but transformation may not always come from the channels that we most expect. Sometimes we have to be paying really close attention to see it. So my friends today, may we laugh. May we use our laughter to hold fast to the truth of who we are. People who struggle. People who struggle sometimes with one another. People who struggle often with God. And yet people who in that struggle live life with God, with joy, and vitality and vigor. People of God looking for transformation in the most unexpected places. May the Lord take our minds and think through them, take our lips and speak through them, and take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Because we have been so richly blessed as a people of God, we return some of our tithes and offerings as a symbol of our continued commitment to a God who blesses us.
everlasting and holy God, we give thanks for all of the gifts you have bestowed upon us in our life, and we give thanks that we are able to return a portion back to you so that your word and our ministries may continue to be fruitful and multiply. Bless these gifts. Help us to use them wisely as your people, that all may come to know of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I invite you to be seated. The service continues with Holy Communion this morning. Hunter. Beloveds, we come to this table because we are claimed in covenant, because we are still learning what covenant and togetherness means, how it looks and moves and feels, because we long for liberation. Because we thirst for justice. Because we know the near need, fierce and urgent, for grace and freedom and nourishment in our flesh and in our bones. Because this is not the table of the United Methodist Church. This is Christ's table, and you are invited to bring your whole lives, and all are welcome here. Because we remember, on the night in which he was arrested, while the powers and principalities of the empire and supremacy and dominance raged, Jesus, a teacher, a healer, a leader, gathered people, invited, invited their fears and longings, invited people into radical solidarity, justice and love and action, healing of and in the world to which, for which he gave his life over and over and over. Jesus took bread, broke it, shared it, and said, take and eat. This is my body, the bread of new life. Share this and remember. And then Jesus took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks for it, and said, take and drink. This is the power of my lifeblood, the salve of salvation the cup of blessing, share this and remember. And so we do. We remember, we offer, we receive, and we share in this nourishing feast because we know how to nourish each other in ordinary and extraordinary ways. Because we need each other and we need this sacrament, this visible sign of life-giving grace flowing and overflowing. So come, Holy Spirit, and bless. Come, power of God, and convict. Loving God, come, loving God, and meet us at this table today. Today's communion will be brought to you at your seats. We want you to be aware that as far as the bread is concerned, inside of the paper cups is gluten-free for those who are gluten-sensitive and there will be juice today distributed to all. All are welcome to partake of this meal today for all are welcome at Christ's table. I invite the ushers to come down at this time.
Jesus said, this body, this bread is my body. Take, eat, and remember me. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, drink and remember. Let us pray. Everlasting and gracious God, we give thanks for this holy sacrament. May it strengthen us in our common ministry as we remember your Son, Jesus Christ, in our life. May we be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to seek out those who are lost, those who strive for justice, those who look for peace. And may we be instruments to be the change in the world of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Let us all stand for our final hymn.
as we go, let us receive this blessing as children of God, given names by God, told who and whose we are. Let us go being led by the hand of God, the God who leads each one of us into beauty, into joy, into delight and life and vitality. Let us go sharing the light and the love of God with all we meet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.